You are watching Leicester Till I Die TV. Good evening, good day, good morning, good afternoon, good night, goodbye. Hello, welcome along. Well, it is Easter. On Friday, we got crucified and we got resurrected on Monday uh, in our um, promotion bid. Uh, well, we were doing, we were top until Ipswich got a goal in about the 154th minute. Uh, but at the moment, it's 1 1 between Leeds and Hull. But Hull are holding, apparently, uh, sorry, Leeds are holding on a bit, it says there on the BBC. So, yeah, welcome well, along. Brad, how are you? I'm a lot better. Than, I'm a lot better to, this evening, Chris, than I was, um, well, about half an hour ago, uh, to be honest with you. But, but it's nice to be talking. Well, we're going to be talking at least about one win, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Feeling better. Not top of the league anymore, but please, Hall, just just don't do a Southampton. No, no. I mean, for one more, I thought, oh, Southampton were going to have a big say in the promotion battle because they're playing Ipswich today. They've got us um, we're in the middle of the running, and then they've got think... Leeds on the last day. But honestly, yeah. if, if that's if that's how they're giving goals away, they're, they're, they're doing a Leicester, aren't they, really? Well, I, look, I, when we... There's another show that you can check out after this one that me and Chris did where we reviewed all four uh, teams in the race for the, well, for the automatic promotion zones. And I said Southampton are probably the team with the biggest disadvantage because even though they had more games in hand, it's probably the worst time of the season, which is mm. typical because we've just come back off the last international break. But it's the worst time of the season to probably have a cluster of games where you're still playing Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, where everybody else is now after this period. Chris, they've got a they've got a bit of a breathing space between the games. Uh, it's not ideal, and then it's proven that way again today. Shot themselves in the foot, you know, with two one up going into the latter stages. They went down to ten men, and then lastminute.com should be the shirt sponsors of Ipswich Town because yet again they've struck. But at the end of the day, we knew this was the case with the with the um, bad run of form we've been in. Hopefully, after today's performance, that's that's a turn in the right direction for us. And at the end of the day, Chris, we said this about last season as well for different reasons. We can't be relying on other teams to to do us favours. If they do, we've got to take advantage of them because it will mean nothing otherwise. Exactly, one hundred percent. You know, it's that you know if we win all our games, we're promoted. It's as simple as that. You know, yeah, um, and, and games are running that, out. Well. Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Luckily for us, games are running out. So as long as our game in hand ironically which is against Southampton is a win and like you say Chris we win the rest it mm. won't matter what the others do because we've seen it we saw it after the result of Norwich the true table of everybody on the same point even yeah. if they win all so that's all we can do we did our job if others do or in their case don't do their job happy days we'll have it a bit easier and a bit of pressure off us it is and actually it, it is a bit of a uh, a more relaxed review. We're not going to go into it in such detail because we've got two matches, as you can see, to review there. And um, um, so we're not, you know, we, we would be here till a kingdom come. Um, look, I, I did say that, that uh, I, I don't know the, uh, it was you I said it to, but there's such a thing as doing a Spursy in North London. Uh, in the Midlands, it's doing a Leicestery. 
Uh, I mean, to go up to away to Bristol, a team in mid table, nothing to fight for, um, and we 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 get beaten. And then we go, you know, we host Norwich. Okay, they've got a bad away record, but they're second in the form table overall on the last five games. Only lost one in five. And we play them off the park. That is just so, so Leicester, isn't it? Yeah. One of the things I learned over my time being a Leicester fan, and this goes all the way back to the first knockings of this first ever season. Now, I don't really remember, but I, I do remember thanks to VHF's tapes. I, remember. I don't remember living it, but I can't remember... Yeah reminiscing about it throughout the years, was the most consistent thing about Leicester is they'll be inconsistent. Um, that wasn't the case for the majority of this season. They're fairly consistent in what we were doing. But in this last batch of 15 games, the sales have been torn, haven't they, from the storm that's been brewing at Leicester. So, yeah, you couldn't have picked two better games to do a... Uh, two sides of the same coin sort of thing you know what i mean like this is this is a disaster this looks very nice and and it's weird isn't it chris like I say bristol city one of the few handful of teams that really haven't got anything to fight for they're too good they're not going down but they're not challenging for a playoff spot no expected go and lose norwich three wins in a row i don't think they conceded in them three games either chris coming in here full of confidence played them off the park and in the end when relatively comfortable it's uh just typical Leicester to do that in that style to us mate isn't it it, it is it is it is and in fair play to, to Bristol uh they won today as well so you know we, we can't say that it was, was was a blip um looking at sort of uh the, the first game unfortunately we have got to look at that one which was a way way at Bristol um we said then that that was a must win game, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it, it was one of them, Chris. That you know, we, we looked at the rest of the fixtures that we had about it, and I said it was pivotal that Leicester got off to a win in that start of the run of games we've got left, and that really didn't happen. And the most worrying thing about it, uh, Chris, a, a, afterwards wasn't the manner of the defeat because it wasn't it wasn't like it was backs against the wall we never got going we 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 clearly and we made a very good strong note of it had some very strong chances to have changed the outcome of that game on 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 the score line but overall i mean you want a game you want two games like i said to represent two opposite polar opposites we were slow we were nervous we were sluggish. We looked like the team that had gone there to hope to get a draw or maybe nick a goal on the counter, not not play the usual Leicester aggressive way, which is still patient and sideways football, which has got to moan every too often. And that was understandable to say. The pressure was really on them to get the result against Norwich. But in this game, this, this had the easiest opportunity for Leicester to put the pressure on teams. And, you know... OK, Leicester kind of got a bit of a favour because um, Leeds could only draw, a bit like what they're doing now. But th this was like that moment where it finally swapped for Leicester and the pressure was really on because it was the first time, I think, Chris, since we reached the summit that we'd actually dropped back into the automatic zones after a weekend of football. I know technically we played today, but prior to this week, we were technically outside the top two for the first time since then. And... For the first time, Chris, I was I was I was worried. I was worried about Leicester, uh, the game coming up. But obviously, hindsight's a wonderful thing, but I was worried about it. We even said in the pre-match, didn't we? We kind of gave a Norwich and a Leicester prediction because of our form. We were worried about it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and rightly so because it was a really damning performance, Chris. I mean, the amount of times I wrote shaky, slow, crossing to nobody on my notepad, Chris, is is worn out. Um, it was a frustrating game, one of our most frustrating afternoons of football. Um, so if you'd have told me what was to follow, was to follow after that, I wouldn't have believed you. I must admit, no, no, I was well, like you said before the Norwich game, we were we were predicting, uh, you know, as much uh, as more as much of a chance of a Norwich win as, as, as a Leicester one. And just looking here, um, and like I say. 
stats. Stats are very nice when you win. They're not so nice when you lose. But, you know, looking at the stats here for this, this game against Bristol, you know, we had um, 61, is that percent possession? Let me just um, let me just make this a little bit larger. Let me pop the Viagra in. Here we go. 61% uh, possession to us, 39 to Bristol. Um, what the, the, the fact that the... the Sorry, the, the stat that stands out to me, three shots on target. Yeah, um, that's never good. And it's very, very difficult to win a game of football when push comes to shove. You you might have all the chances, but you're only hitting the target three times. Um, you know, OK, you could say I think one of Vardis hits the post, which is technically off target because it's not inside the frame of the goal, but it... It was another one that was close that you could probably add into that bracket. And it was just one of them games, and it was I haven't had that feeling for a while, Chris, um, was one of them games that the longer it went on, the more it seemed to play out, the way it was playing out, I just mm. I just felt it was inevitable. We were just not going to get back into the game. The, the result was done. And it was frustrating because it was one of them games where with the great respect to Bristol City, congratulations on making it uh, another win for them. They're trying to, you know, end the season strong, which is brilliant for any team like that. You want to try and keep momentum going and then make yourself more admirable for maybe signings in the summer if you have a strong finish. But we really should have won that game and we should really, Chris, have, have used it as a game where the expectancy was, like I said, the greatest respect was for Leicester to have turned up, you know, again, if you said to me, turn up in one performance, get beaten the other, and results are vice versa, probably more expectant if we beat Bristol 3-1, you'd think and Norwich lose 1-0, but that wasn't the case. And that's why it was so alarming, Chris, because was, they never looked like it at points, did they? They had four flashes of brilliance that fell to our top goal scorer, and mm. even he was having an off day. Um, in front of goal, so yeah, I, I actually, I, I, as sad as it is, I was watching back. Um, so well, I'm not, not sad enough to watch myself back, but I was clipping, uh, doing some clips from the um, Bristol City watch along. And at 75 minutes, I actually made the comment, We've had three shots on goal in 75 minutes, we're not going to get two shots on, on goal that are going to go in in the last 15. And, you know, I, I, I could not see any other... I could not see us winning. Yeah, it just felt like the tempo of the game, the way things were going off, silly little things as well, like wayward passes, um, mm. mishit passes, overhit balls, just nothing seemed to click fully. Kill, clicked in parts, but it was kind of a bit magoo at some stage or another, whether that was at, at the end or sometimes in the middle, and it kind of stumbled towards the front. It kind of fell into the ball at times as well. But, you know, it kind of really put the emphasis then on on, on the Norwich game. Uh, and then that was, that I will say, if you needed a response of character from the players, they definitely delivered in, in, in the upcoming game. But that was damning at the time. And I don't think... You know, it's probably our job to try and be calm ahead as best we can, Chris, um, when we do shows like this and, and post-match. More more for um, strikes and warnings than, than anything. Yeah. But it was a game that if we really wanted to or really felt the need to, we really could have realistically had a bit of a panic show and hit the panic button because it was a panic in defeat, Chris. There was this, there's been so much... I'm saying nonchalantness, but there's been a case of fans just going, oh, well, no, it's all right. We, we will win the next game. It just hasn't worked. You know, we were going to beat Hall, but we could only get a draw, which, okay, so so a Leeds at the moment. But, you know, you know what I mean? Like, I think the, the thing is, it just shows you how this end of the season can mess with, with teams' heads because, okay, Ipswich today, they won their game, Chris, but they were run ragged for 85 minutes until the red card. They've only just stroked to win. Congratulations for them. They got the win. Leeds at the moment might go on and win the game, but they're struggling at Hall. Uh, you know, Leicester struggled against Bristol City last week. 
So it, it, we, I think we all know that we're in for a chop and change week in, week out. This could change. Yeah. God, you know, the, the last game of the season, Chris, could be a could be a bloody roulette wheel on bloody change of first and second, couldn't it, at this yeah. rate, with the way Ipswich and Leicester are... It, it could go one of many ways, and I think we have to accept that. Um, I don't like the fact that the Leeds goalkeeper is wearing the same colour outfit as Mads Manson does. That really does, right. does worry me. Uh, I just want to divert for a minute because if you want, I know you weren't, you haven't, you were eating earlier, but for those that watched the earlier show, which was the debate show, Let's Talk Leicester, I want to just come on and I'm going to bring this point up again because A, it's a different show and B, we're talking about the Bristol game. I just want to bring that up. Does Daka deserve the abuse? Um, Vardy in that Bristol game missed four sitters, if you like. Two of them were guilt-edged. Yeah. And he, he, I don't remember seeing him get much abuse. Daka misses one today, gets abuse, you know, and, and you know, he, what's, what's he doing? Why is he in the squad? You know, Vardy, we, we've seen games, haven't we, for Vardy, where he's he's had nine touches all game. He gets absolutely nothing. You know, oh, well, the players weren't passing to him. You know, Daka had very few touches today. Oh, he's rubbish. What's he doing in the squad? Shouldn't be in there. What, what's he doing? Why is he being picked? It does seem, does it not, that, you know, whatever, Var, whatever Vardy... Oh, Paul nearly got one then. Whatever Vardy does, it doesn't matter. And yes, you know, he's had a brilliant career. And yes, he's allowed mistakes. Of course he is. He makes mistakes. He's missed penalties, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, we'd have, we'd have maybe we'd have made it through to the semi-finals of the, UO, of the uh, Champions League if he'd uh, got his shooting boots on. But what gets me is that he does the same as Daka, or Daka does the same as him. And, and you know, Daka missed one chance today. Was getting abuse in the in the post match, Vardy. I gave him abuse, not over because of his you know time with us, but on that match, as I said before to Kate, he was shit. Yeah, he was, and you know you, you're quite right, Chris. We always say we'll praise people and players, managers when they deserve it, and when it's not, when it's been a bad performance, doesn't matter if it's um, shouldn't matter. Well, it shouldn't matter. It doesn't to me anyway. It doesn't matter if it's Vardy or if it's, um, you know, bloody, I don't know. Yeah, Dakar. If it is Dakar, just to keep the example in reason. Because, yeah. Chris, um, I think Dakar had a good game against Norwich. I, I actually think he did. I think his chance was very difficult. I don't think Vardy scored. I certainly will reiterate what I'd say. Vardy won't score it. But Chris, I mean, you're talking about a player that's obviously, I mean, he's got 16 goals this season. So he's obviously been far and away our better striker. But these players have scored goals when called upon and given a run in a time. Ian Acho, Cannon, although yet again, uh, sticky tape for legs. He's, he's injured, isn't he? So, But when he's had his run in the team, he got goals. Daka, um, Daka's, you know, nearly set up a goal today. He brilliantly brought the ball down and laid it off for Harry Winks, uh, who had a shot just over the bar. He was here, he was involved in a build up several times, laying the ball off either to Fatawu or trying to play it through. So he's going unnoticed in what he does. And it's because, right, we had the same problem with Ian Acho in his first couple of seasons. It's because we're expecting him to succeed like that. We're expecting him to instantly show that, that we, I think there's a panic around Vardy retiring that we're not quite ready to pass the torch to these players, but we're never going to know until we give them that moment, Chris, what they're really capable of doing in a strong run in this team. And to be fair to Daka against Bristol City, it was probably the first time, Chris, I'd have said, really, I even think Daka would have taken one of them chances. I yeah. mean, I've got one page here of second half notes, Chris. 51 minutes, Vardy should score, double save, goalkeeper. I think Mad's got the rebound on the second one. All right. Then I got uh, Vardy keeps missing. Vardy's not looking confident. And in 62 minutes, I, I literally wrote in big letters, Chris, and I'll show it on the camera. You can't see it. Take Vardy off. And also sign a corner taker, which we actually, ironically, did go on to solve in the Norwich game, in my opinion. But yeah, he was awful. 
He missed two Vardy esque chances and then two chances that I've got to. We've got to, Chris, as much as we love him, he can't be wrapped in bubble wrap and not given the same for each striker. If, if Dakin we misses it, I cruise over the season. We're just complaining about him in that game. And, you know, as Derek says here, Dakar didn't miss the glorious chances Vardy missed on Friday. You know, yeah. um, I don't know. I wanted Daka to come off today, not because yeah. he was particularly playing badly. I don't think he was going to score. It was just one of those games. Um, you know, he wasn't really in the game. And I just think at that point, because it was one all when I was shouting for the sub, and I just thought, Vardy will come on. It will get the crowd going. It will get yeah. the crowd going if Vardy comes on. It will get the teammates coming on. He's coming on, takes the captain's armband. Yeah, and... And you know, and and it then will worry the defense. Now, that was the reason I wanted him to come on and come on earlier than he, he did. My worry with the likes of, and Dakar, whether it depends, I mean, we don't know with all this FS or PPI, whatever shit we've got going on, um, that uh, who we might have to sell just to survive. So, you know, we don't know who's going to be here next season. My worry is that. We are we are falling very much into a Mares situation, as I like to call it, because whoever we had on that right never had a chance with the fans. Oh, he's not as good as Mares. Oh, Mares would do better than that, you know. And yes, we we had some awful players. We know Diabate uh, uh, and Kaputska. We did have some awful ones, but. Nobody was ever going to be good enough for the Leicester fans compared to, to Mares. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I get that. I think it's the same with Vardy. You know, Vardy's like, he'll always be, oh, it's, it's, Vardy would have put that away. Oh, Vardy in his prime, all this. And that's the worry that, uh, you know, um, until we get a, uh, until we get a player, Lee's claiming a penalty, <laughs> didn't get it. Uh, until we get a player that's going to come in and score 15, 20 goals a season, yeah, sorry, you paused them as if something was happening. I thought there was something happening in the football. Which I, don't know. <laughs> I thought there was going to be something happening, but it, it wasn't. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, I, I think this is the problem with any, any, you know, how many, you know, that guy that was in the chat earlier that was just dissing Dakar, it's all he posted. Yeah, and unfortunately, any fan base has a small minority like that. They just want to hate for hate's sake and think that if they jump on the bandwagon, nobody's going to agree with them. Um, it's funny you use Vardy and Mahrez as your example of comparison. There, obviously, it's obvious to, to make them comparisons for the big name and, and and the names they left in the club. You know, the legacy they left here with what they did and achieved. But that that that's a very good point as well, Chris, because because both Mahrez and Vardy took a season and a half to get going. Vardy nearly walked away from yeah. football. Mahrez yeah. was still getting, you know, was Knockout was still holding down his position when Mahrez first joined. He didn't break. It's not like he came into the team, both of them, and got 20 goals a season. They took a while to get going. It, well, in football terms, anyway, a season and a half isn't a bad time to get going. And, yeah. and, and look, when, when did we sell Mahrez, Chris? What was it, 2018, hmm. 19? I, I, it was before COVID, know. wasn't it? So it was before yeah. then. So so what, the, let's say this 17, 18 season, we maybe sold him. I think it was something like that. Anyway, and now look, we're in 2024, Chris, that 2023-24 season. So that's that's what six years on from that season, the 17, 18 season. Mm. And we've only just started to really get to grips with a right winger that we think has got the potential to be up up there with yeah. with what we got from Morris and Fatawa. And he's only a low knee. Hopefully we don't succumb to having to not make that permanent. Because mm. that will crush me. Um I'll have to would disband my faith in anything. Would that crush you more than in actual leaving? Uh yeah, it really would. Because we've seen what we we've seen. Whilst I love Ian Atcher and I've seen what Ian Atcher can do, he's not going to sign a new contract. He's not the future of Leicester strike force. This kid has the no. potential to be a long term future at Leicester. You know, unless he gets stars in his eyes, like some of them do after a season with us. I hope not, but mm -hmm. he seems to be so wholesome. I'd love to say he's someone we get in and and, and start this rebuild and reclimb. Should we get into the Premier League under him? He has a very good potential, Chris. I'd be gutted yeah. if he doesn't join us. I really 100% agree. Um, what did we do wrong in this game? Just too passive, Chris. Too slow. Did 
Does being smart and neat and tidy, which we were at times, but it was with no progress. It's that's that's the part that really mixed. I think we let the let the occasion maybe get to us, the pressure get to us. I I, I don't know, Chris, because the crowd was awful. I know mm. I'm not taking anything away from the Bristol City performance itself, but their crowd was awful. You literally could have muted the Leicester fans and you would have heard someone shout, Lou want two sugars with the coffee from downstairs. <laughs> it was that quiet. So it wasn't like they were overawed by the crowd either. The crowd weren't mm. intimidating or anything like that. You know how they say like Ellen Road, Leeds yeah. United fans can be that way, although they're probably the only timid thing they're doing is timidly shaking in their boots because they're drawing still. But you know what I mean? It wasn't like mm. that was against them. Um, it wasn't like, you know, really great, like you've already said, Chris, it wasn't like we were playing a team Okay, a team in form, granted, but a team that hadn't had only like you know wasn't doing much in the league. Um, not the greatest at home either. They had a very dodgy home form. I think they lost five out of the last six at home. Mm-hmm. They were there for the taking, Chris, and we just we just seemed scared. We just seemed too fragile, and unfortunately, we had to lose that game to probably get the wake up and response we did. Yeah. Because night and day is what we're going to talk about when we get on to the next game. Because this game, they were just slow, Chris. Yeah. Static at times, well, just, to be honest. I just want to say to Derek, we're not talking FSR. We did do in the earlier show at 7, which can still be found on the Leicester Till I Die YouTube channel. Uh, or go and check the interview I did with uh, Gavin McGaw, uh, ex- executive of the EFL. And we talk all about that. So, um, But to know, we're looking, it's a reviewed show tonight. Uh, but thanks for your point, Derek. Appreciate it. Um, do we forget? Are, are we expecting too much of Enzo? I think so. I think fans had a reason to start expecting too much and getting carried away because I don't even think the most optimistic of Leicester fan could have seen what we was on the potential of doing. I know, I know, I know the record's gone, right? And that was an added bonus. We've always said that'd be an added bonus if you get it. We can't get yeah. it. So well done, Reading. You proved how difficult it really is to maintain that running to get 106 points. Well, more than that to break it. So the, 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 their record gets to live another day. Uh, well, another season at least, should I say. But yeah, I think we did because Enzo's the sort of manager, given his experience, given his age and given his sort of experience in the game that okay and i know i know we're not talking about it tonight but i didn't bear the question and maybe whether leicester chose the long route on a shorter or or, or a cheaper option and i'm not saying he's a bad manager and we took a bad option or anything i'm saying that he wouldn't be demanding as much as maybe trying to get a neil warnock in or something like that to get us straight back up probably would have cost us a lot more to get them in and he's definitely a manager that maybe, if it doesn't go well, Chris, we have to stick with him. I think we have to, we have kind of have to look at one team that's managed to make a success out of a player come manager. I know, I know Mar- Maresk is a bit older than, than Arteta, and I can't believe I'm making this comparison, but he was, he's been given full control at Arsenal, hasn't he? He's been allowed yeah. to bring his youngsters in that he liked. He's been able to make the signings that he wants. He's been trusted. And I think that's what we need to do, not just as a board, but as a fan base as well. We need to trust him. Because I don't want a stopgap manager that for eight months in the Premier League, say next season, he's got us 18th, 17th, 16th, and we sack him. Mm. I want him to have the job like what Burnley are entrusting Vincent Company to do. You know, I'm not saying... I've never said that every player manager is an absolute dumpster truck of a manager. Rooney, Lampard and Gerrard are proving that for me, and Scott Parker, that is normally the case, but you do get a gem, Chris. You do get a footballer yeah. with a brain that's beyond playing it on the pitch. I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. What I mean is some of these players, they analyse everything, Chris. They learn, they absorb mm-hmm. things like a sponge, whereas some player managers think they can just go in there and pretend they're a captain in the dressing room and it's going to work for them, and it doesn't. I think Moreska needs that five, six years, maybe, at Leicester to really get his case aboard of what he can do. Yeah, I was talking to Anil uh, on the show earlier at seven, uh, and we we try not to talk too much about the review because we were doing this show. 
but he he sort of accused um, uh, Enzo of being stubborn uh, and not having a you know plan B's. Well, you know, look at Pearson. I don't think you got anybody more stubborn than Pearson in the Great Escape year. Whatever, about, however things were going wrong, he would not pick all Brighton because he'd, he'd had a fallout with his missus allegedly. Um, and as soon as he started picking all Brighton, we went on a run, run and stayed up. Yeah. Um, Martin O'Neill was, you know, he had a bad start when he first came in. You know, he, he didn't have the door, were he, Chris? He, yeah, they were, they were after him in the car park. You know what I mean? Yeah. The fans. And look what he went on. And, and obviously, we've, we've had a good start, but do you think Enzo's got a problem with that? I mean, for me, yeah, I, I'd pick that team in the morning that was today. The only thing I got wrong was uh, Doyle for Justin. And Doyle had a decent game. I, I, I can't say it, that was a wrong choice. But... Is it you know people people can see that and go, yeah, we know what team they're going to play. Now my yeah. argument back on that was, don't want to be changing it week in week out and changing players around. That's what we did when we you know in the Great Escape year at the start. Yeah, we we had a lot of that, and it wasn't until we got, I mean, the January window helped us out in that Great Escape. Definitely did. Yeah. Um, I don't think he's actually stubborn. I think he's just a bit naive you know like you said chris if you take out what what was it nine 14 games or whatever it was at palmer yeah it, so yeah you know so we're the first team he's had a cemented season with now he couldn't do anything in january and we're figuring out why slowly over these last three weeks why that might have been nobody's fault but the but the board's over expenditures well, allegedly, because mm. we haven't been found guilty yet, but that might have been why a certain deal never happened in January. It took so long to get through. But mm. he was entrusted to do his job in the window. And that tells me that the board sat him down and listened to what he had to say and, and, and went to back him, Chris. And I honestly think if they could have, they would have backed him in the January transfer window. They would have got the same came... things they could have done, yes. Yeah, because, yeah. because Chris... Same things you're saying with other managers, other boards showing they had the trust. Chris, he was given the license to do what he wanted. You don't want to be here? Let me know. I'll try and convince you. And if not, you still want to leave, you're free to go. I don't want anyone here that's not committed. That's fine. I don't want to hold you back. Barnes, Yuri, didn't even bother sitting him down, thank God, to be honest with you, because he's frustrating Villa fans. He's not changed. Um, he's, That's a Villa problem now. Um, but Madison Barnes didn't were happy to stay, but realistically they wanted to be in the Premier League, and they obviously felt they they, they deserved to be in the Premier League. Chris, um, all right, off you go. Bang, who wants them? Okay, how much? Well, we want this much. Okay, deal. Bang, done. Okay, I want this player in. Okay, get him in. Okay, I want this player. Okay, got him. Bang, you know what I mean? Bam, bam. Whether we agreed with some of them, not. You know, seventy-five goalkeepers, and he signed another one. Worked out perfectly fine for me. Promoted a youngster ahead of the two we got in that were the Brendan Brigade. Yeah. Happy for that, the way they've both played for us during the season, for the majority part of it. You know, so he, he's obviously someone that the board are trusted. And I think that's what we need to do as fans, because I think we've seen glimpses of it, Chris, haven't we? Where he's done something different. Or he's put on a different style of player in a certain position. So even though the pattern or the shape's not really changed, the style of build-up changed because all of a sudden we've taken Vardy off and put Ian Atcher on, so we've got an extra man in the midfield. You know, the yeah. midfielders can overlap because he comes short or the opposite way around, Chris. So I think he has an idea to use a plan B. It's just when he registers it and sees it, he'll use it. Because the day, you could say, was completely different from the Bristol game in terms of just stepping the tempo up. Chris, we have the quality of players that when it works... We do what we did today to oppositions. Yeah. We play like that. It's just when it's not, Chris, when the parts aren't quite turning in the same direction or not moving so smoothly that we get results like we did against Bristol. Do do you think, and, oh, my God. Oh, Leeds have just hit the post. Thank God for that. You scared the bejeebus out of me. <laughs> Because um, I can't watch it. I've got it on BBC and it just says 1 1. And you said that and I just went bing. <laughs> yes. I know. I've got them both. I'll tell you. At the moment, they were saying earlier there was only looking like one team that was going to win it, which was Hull. 
But now I'm going to say Leeds are are, are knocking Sorry, on the Chris, door. Sorry, Chris, who was that? That was, was Leeds. That? Leeds, you <laughs> they know. They were up in the box again. They've taken Bamford off, by the way. But you 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 preempted my next question, which was: Does Enzo have a plan B or C? I think he does. We've seen it. It's it's just it's not what people would expect a plan B to to be. A plan B would be. Um, no, they're going to change formation. They're going to go two up front or, the, you know, I'm going to give it as an example. So that we'd completely change shape. We'd go to like a flat four, flat four in midfield, maybe change the system, go four, four, two, which is what Norwich do. What we do, and and, and sometimes it backfires because sometimes with Enzo, his substitutions seem reactive because they happen at certain points. And sometimes he does make reactive substitutions, which is, again, naivety. It's an experience. Some managers take that second to absorb it because sometimes we're making subs after the goals have been conceded or scored when really we want to let it play out for a minute or two and let the players on the pitch respond. Yeah. Um, but he does make them little tweaks. We've seen it in games, Chris, where we're not so sideways. We're a little bit more direct. We're we're not asking Fatawu and Mavidi to, to stick to left and right. They're coming in side to support. We're, you know, we're we're going from not seeing in uh, not seeing Kieran Dewsbury Hall and, and Winks make an overlap and run a dare to go in opposition half to the next game. Chris, they're daring to go into the edge of the box and trying to score. I mean, they had they had a couple of half chances each today, which they didn't even get a half chance against Bristol City. No, so it no. is a little bit night and day, but it is it's not as drastic as other teams that maybe have a second tactic or a second shape they go to. Yeah, and and uh, we we can argue the the the, the uh, about the uh, man of the match. I think we did when we uh, when it was announced um, by Alan, who does it for us, and he goes to all the matches. He's there. We only see what's being shown on the screen. He see what's going on off the field. So, uh, agree or not, you know, he, he has he has the final say. Um, but um, about phase, mm, yeah. but look four for the performance, and I think that kind of sums it up, doesn't it? We could have still been playing that game. Now we wouldn't be. We wouldn't have scored. No, that's 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 the annoying thing about it. And again, you don't like to get like that as a fan, but when you see the limited chances you get go begging and their keepers pulling saves out of his rear end and you're getting sucker punched by the one the only goal of the game you just it's the acceptancy of fans isn't it we know this game's inside and out and even though it's still likes to throw a surprise on us we are just like oh here we go this just isn't our day and at the end of the day for being realistic at a push would we have warranted getting a point had Jamie Vardy took one of his chances I think so, Chris. I think mm. so, because we were on top for a period of majority of that second half. But ultimately, if you said to me, only one team deserves to win, who you're picking, and I have to be fair, it was Bristol, because they created the better of the chances uh, in the first and second half. Now, like I, I've, I said at the start, you know, if you've supported Leicester long, long enough, you, you know, you'll know that we don't beat who we're expected to, and then we go out and beat who we expect to lose to. And that you have got, you have seen in this, in this bank holiday weekend, you have seen Leicester city's history in a nutshell. Uh, I think with these two games, because bring on Norwich, they, they rolled up at the KP uh, second in the form table, looking to uh, cement their place in the top, uh, in the top six and a playoff position. Um, went one nil up. And I thought, here we go. They're going to really... Because that was against the run of play, in fairness. But then it always seems to be when Leicester go 1-0 down. Um, yeah. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. And we... I'm not OK. It wasn't probably like watching Brazil. But, you know, it certainly wasn't a, 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 a score in a four performance there, was it? No, it wasn't. Again, to... Two games, two completely different performances, two completely different outcomes. We played Norwich, unbeaten in the last three games, in form, holding on to that playoff zone. They'd have been buzzing with how they did on Friday and Hall dropping points. Um, all right, they've got away with it today because Cardiff did them a favour, but you would have thought 
if you you know, like I said, if we if you'd have said to me, Brad, you're gonna win one, lose one, I'd have gone for fuck's sake, first of all. But I said, okay, so we're we're losing to Norwich at home, but we're beating Bristol City. And the contrast, Chris, it's unbel- it's phenomenal the contrast between the two appearance the two games. Because you say about a plan B, Chris, I say slight tweaking. There's you know, Le- Le- Leicester really did control that game. What have you just seen, Chris? Stop doing that to me. Sorry. Leeds are claiming a penalty, but it was absolutely brilliant defending by Hull, and the referee got it spot on. The Hull player got the ball first, and it's a corner. Uh, sorry, but I was looking at that, and I'm thinking, Leeds, Leeds players were all around the referee. But oh, um, you threw me off. Very nervous. But yeah. And at the end of the day, Chris, look, we were just quicker. Everything, yeah. everything was was right about what Leicester did today. And even when they went to goal down, Chris, it would have been easy for the crowd. And I have to give a little bit of credit because despite the moaning myrtles that have been going on in these last few weeks, rightly or wrongly, depending on how they came, came about it, Chris, um, you know... We went 1-0 down, Chris, completely against the run of play. Literally the only part of dominance that Norwich had was that attack the whole game. And that's not exaggerating. That's not really today. They were, they were probably one of the worst teams. And the first team for a while, Chris, that came to the King Power and didn't read the instructions left by others because they set up perfectly for Leicester. Sit back, try and frustrate us. And teams this season that have done that to us have been ripped apart. I said it on many a... Preview show when I've had to step in for Craig or talking to away supporters, say, oh, well, opposition fans. And I said, if you sit back at us, you'll, you, you, yeah, you might frustrate us and it might take us 60 minutes or 70 minutes to break, break us down, but we'll break you down. We're relentless with it because you're giving us the freedom of the part to pass it around you. And that's something we do probably the best in the division, I would say. I know we're not top of the league. I'm not saying we're the best in the league because you can't be until you're top, but we're the best in the division at absolutely relentlessly going at a team who sit behind the ball. It's actually more when you get in our face that we get a little bit panicky. And that did happen today. But unlike yes, unlike Friday's game, Chris, everything was coming up Millhouse. The bobble deflections, if we weren't getting the handball, we got the goal. You know, if, if the ball got lost, someone was there to retrieve it. Someone was making a committed tackle. And that was the big one, <laughs> Chris. The yeah. committed the commitment from the players, they weren't letting a loose ball go, they weren't dropping their heads, they weren't throwing their arms in the air when someone dispossessed them unfairly. They got up, they got back, they put us they put a tackle in, and sometimes they won the ball fairly and put less on the front foot. So the fact that they got in at half time my level, as I said, was the biggest turning point of that game. Because once we got level, Chris, unlike against Bristol, because we didn't score in that game, but unlike against Bristol also, I felt we could win it. Mm. I don't know about you, but I felt like it was pivotal. The second goal was probably more pivotal because it was our biggest dominant uh, control of the game in terms of the forward play. You know, we had a lot of mini chances up, leading up into that goal, so it seemed more inevitable that it was going to happen. Mm. But I really did feel that we was going to turn the screw and get the three points today. You know, we said we'd take the win oh. uh, and not have the performance, but we got both today, which was probably a double. Leeds have just scored, haven't they? No, Leeds have just got a penalty. Oh, well. Look, then, they, Chris, I don't know I don't know why you're bothering getting there to get you down. At the end of the day, if they score and win, then they've, they've done their job. At the end of the day, we're in this situation, Chris. So, it is what it, it was, is. I'm not going to let it It was a penalty as well. It was a clear penalty. The referee got that right again. Hi, Anthony, by the way. Well, looks um, like Leeds are going to... S- Snag a last minute one, a whole keeper might say, but if he doesn't, he doesn't, Chris. At the end of the day, we've already shown before before these games kicked off today that as long as Leicester do their job against Birmingham and the Millwall and Southampton and Plymouth and, and, and you know, and whoever else is left after that, Chris, mm. that's all we can do. And at the end well, of the Leeds day, argue, two Leeds players here arguing about who's taking the penalty. Oh, well, that's never good. At the end of the day, Chris, these have got to do the same because if they're mm-hmm. struggling in the games that they're playing today, that you know, one bad result isn't going to decide this. We've seen that with the Bristol result; it hasn't decided anything. Mm-hmm. You know, the the, the 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 Leeds captain is having has separated yeah. them. Yeah, um, you know, for 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 what four and a half hours, Leicester were top. They're going to go back to third. 
yeah. But at the end of the day, Chris, they're still going to play some dodgy oppositions. They're still going to have tough games, just as we are. All we can do is hope. So, so, so Hall and and Southampton weren't able to do us a favour. Yeah, we shouldn't be relying on others, should we? No, and exactly, exactly. So, I go, sort of, Leeds got a lucky late winner. Well done, Leeds. They've gone back top for, for a bit. Yeah. So come again Saturday, we'll do it again. Just to go back to what you were saying, 47% of the action was in the Norwich third. But we completely controlled it. 13% I... was in our third. Yeah, we completely controlled that game from start to finish. I mean, there wasn't many notes. In fact, my first note on Norwich, ironically, um, after the substitute, because they got they had an injury early on in the game, was um, 13 minutes, they switched off. Uh, Leicester switched off and Mads made an easy save. Very comfortable. It was mm. hit straight at him. And then the goal they scored. From the from their first of two corners, they managed the entire game. Chris, we were in complete control. A lot of times in my in in my notes, I'm saying great pressing, um, chance Leicester, penalty appeal. There was a lot of them today. Whether one of them two should have, but yeah, chance looking good on the ball. Leicester Leicester looking good. There wasn't many times I was stood here going Norwich are dominating the ball. We completely yeah. controlled them. It was a very controlled Leicester three points. Um, but uh, and it, and it obviously, look, it's proved vital. It's proved yeah. vital, Chris, because Leeds and, and Ipswich have done their jobs. So seemingly so. There are still a few minutes going in the Leeds game, but they have done their job. So it's a good, you know, this is what I mean, Chris. We have to just keep winning now. So Birmingham, we go again on, on a Saturday. Um, I mean, kind of makes you go typical now because the Bristol game uh, you know, we'd have them extra points on the board. Well the seven minutes add, added on though in fairness so mm. uh, just looking at it, I mean alright, you know, we had 61% possession we had all the possession against Bristol but 18 shots this week, six on target Yeah and again you know, we said about Bristol we don't want to take anything away from their performance they were a good side and and out of the two of us are the only ones that deserve to really win the game it was stark contrast Leicester were afforded the ball they looked hungrier they looked energised they looked up for it it's like something had finally ticked it's like that defeat to Bristol suddenly awoke them the fights inside them and they realised they can't put in performances like that and get away with it they need to be on top of their game and playing as best they can um, so for me, it, it was, um, it was a game where I didn't too much care for the performance because I just wanted the three points, but to get both Chris was so fat, satisfying. That is a game, you know, Bristol city, you know, we did to, we did to Norwich today, what Bristol city did to us, which was completely limit Norwich attack wise. And yeah. and we flooded them with our own attack, and, and and it paid dividends, Chris. You've got to create chances to have have any sort of hope of getting a win in any game, no matter where you are in the league. It's chalk and cheese, isn't it? Those two games, really, and, and that's summed up by you know, I mean, uh, and and we couldn't we couldn't pick up when I mean, we had how many of us here was that? Um, well, I had three written in, down. Where my notes are, yeah, I had three, didn't we? And we actually had, um, who did I went for Fatuwu in the end? I, yeah, we, I we went Fatuwu. I think KDH we got. Had, we had three different man of the matches. You and me, Fatuwu, Luke and Alan, as you can see there, KDH. Although he was on my list as well. Joyal from from Kate, and we couldn't pick a man of the match last week because they were all so awful. But this week it was because we, we couldn't, we couldn't, you know, pick pick a a right one out of a barrel of ripe apples uh, and the performance got an eight. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, you went nine. So, yeah. I gave it a nine. I mean, there was so, again, the biggest chalk and cheese you're ever going to get in two comparison games. One where we didn't want to give a man of the match and really didn't think they wanted a, a decent rating. And another one, Chris, where eight nines were being thrown around 
there were phases. It was Mavadidi's man of the match. KDH was man of the match. Harry Winks was man of the match. They were all man of the match performances to a degree. The majority of them were anyway, Chris, because of what they offered. And, and they, you know, you can see, I can't remember who it was on the watch on, Chris. I think it was Jeff said, you know, it's a good performance when there's so many diverse man of the matches. Yes. Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's good. They're the headaches you want as a manager. You know, you want to be able to sit there as a manager and go, God, not one of you do I need to single out. You all deserve a team praise because you all played so well. Uh, wrong. If someone had done a one-man show, scored a hat-trick and Bruni made every tackle go in and been the only one try, and they'd have got all the poor lits, but have still won the game. But it's it was a performance that, OK, I can't say it wasn't necessary because it was necessary in a, in, in a long way, the performance. Because even the game that we won a few weeks ago, Chris, and in the draw against Hull, it weren't convincing, were it? It was more of a case of, okay, we got the nitty-gritty win, but we got it, and then, okay, we nicked a draw against Hull, but you never watched that performance and went, either of them games, and went, yeah, we, we, we were fairly solid. You know, Hull, I didn't see us getting a, a second goal from it, but we did. You know what, right, when, I was, when I was doing the prep for the watch-along, I literally could not remember us beating Sunderland. Yeah, it was one of them games. I think both games against Sunderland were a bit forgettable. I think we had one decent chance, took it. And they're both early goals, yeah. weren't they? It was JJ in two minutes against Sunderland at the King Power. And it was about 17, 18 minutes into it against them at their place. And then and, that was uh, look the at game. That and like, Hang on, we've won one in the last five. Who, who, who was that? I literally could not even remember playing them. You know, and it was only yeah. the 5th of March as well. Yeah, we did a double over Sunderland, and it's probably the most forgettable double we'll do all season, Chris. Yeah. You know, yeah. it uh, says a lot about it. Um, yeah. you know, Jamie Vardy after 13 minutes, I don't even yeah. remember his goal or yeah. anything. You know. <laughs> 11, 11 minutes difference between JJ's goal against him at the King Power, where he scored after two minutes or three minutes. Yeah. Uh, so, it, yeah. It, it's funny how... <sighs> Your your feelings change about football. We were so down four days ago. Now we're back up. Yes, all right, so we dropped to third again. Um, but, you know, with performances like that, it's only going to be good running, isn't it? But if we perform how we did against Bristol, then it's, it's playoffs, here we come. Yeah, and that, that, that's just it, Chris. The one thing less they need to do is kind of go back to how they were at the start of the season and do something that's probably a little bit uncharacteristic in this running, and that's mm. not be so Leicester-y. You know, we've got some big opportunities coming up. We've got a nice home game at Birmingham, and I mean nice because it's at home. I think after that win, you want to be back at the King Power again. You want that place rocking again, live, breathing the confidence, and you want to get two wins on the bounce because that will really get them believing and going again. Because, Chris, I, I'm jumping the gun here. I'm going to say it. Look, we know our situation, Chris, is right. We have seven games left. Other teams have six. If Leicester win seven out of seven, they win the championship. Don't matter what it puts do, don't matter what leads do. Okay, so uh, uh, no, because leads leads won't even leads won't even be level with us, would they? Because because they both played a game more now, haven't they? It's which in yeah. yeah, yeah. So Leicester would go top of the division and win it, Chris. And we know where our true position would lie if we can make sure we win our game in hand. And I believe, Chris, it's. Birmingham at home, Millwall away, and then Southampton. We've got that rearranged fixture with Southampton, haven't we, at home? I can tell you, I have the information Go here. Go on then, Chris. Tell me that. Birmingham are at home, yeah, on Saturday. Then Millwall away on the Tuesday. And then it's Plymouth away. Um, oh, Plymouth, is it? Plymouth are in there. On the Friday. And then, the, so we play Tuesday and then we play Friday. Thanks, mm. EFL and Sky. Yeah, thanks for that one. And then we've got Saturday the 20th, West Brom. Tuesday the 23rd, Southampton. 
Saturday the 27th, Preston, and then round it all off against the Blackburn Rovers side, who just looked to be hitting form by winning 5-1 today. Well, <laughs> one game doesn't change their season, does it really? They've had a positive. But look, Chris, you've just said right, you've just gone through the fixture. So we've got four games before we play our game in hand. That's for me, if you want to break it down into sections, Chris, we've got four big games to try and psychologically get ourselves in front. And yes, oh, we've that's got to remember that Ipswich will are going to lose one of their games. Oh, so oh yeah, okay. They will yeah. when the semi-finals get played. Oh, granted. three one, it's all over. Oh fuck you, Leeds. At least if you're gonna win win two fucking one. I had the fucking three points gone on the predictions league again, you tight fisted Yorkshire cunt. <laughs> the thoughts of Brad are not necessarily the thoughts of, of the channel. What did I get? I can't even remember what time went. went for a 2-2. Two, two. Oh, I do. Well, I've got no points. Well, I've got, an, I've got an extra point on that, which I think has taken me to 13 now. So I didn't fall too far behind you in the overall assumptions, I don't think. I think if you got 16, I'm only... Now, what is it with Leeds and Ipswich? 97 fucking minutes. Well, I mean, said that Leeds were ahead anyway, weren't they? Yeah, uh, yeah, but it's one of them. It would have been a lot four. worse had we lost today. Obviously, we'd have been in a hell of a lot worse situation. Well, again, and that that makes it even more pivotal. That makes it even more pleasing because imagine if we were sat here two defeats, and now all of a sudden fate was out of our hands. This is this is what I mean, Chris. I would say less the season now. You could break it down into three sections. You've got Birmingham, uh, Millwall, Plymouth, and West Brom. You've got them ahead of that game, and okay, let's say Ipswich played. We'll we'll, we'll get level on games before we play that game. But the South by the time the Southampton game rolls around, Chris, we should be level mm -hmm. with them, or, or or they would have played their catch up game the day before or day after us. Well, whatever. Let's just assume that save the headache of maths that when we play that, that's the only catch up game left. If Leicester can find a way, Chris, and yes. It means someone's got to drop points. I don't care who, as long as it's it's which or leads. Because Southampton are cooked. Your race is done, Southampton. You mm. needed to, the pile looks too much for you. I saw it coming. I got that. I'm, I'm sure. I'm well, 100 percent sure near enough. I've got that right because it which was vital today. They needed to draw, beat it, which and they didn't do it. Um, but if Leicester can get to a position, Chris, where they play Southampton. They've gone on a nice little run of five games in a row because they're including the Norwich game. So they win them four, and they're two, you know they're one point two points ahead before they play that game in hand. That means whilst the draw wouldn't be ideal, it would still be a bonus to Leicester. You know what I mean? It someone becomes a double bonus game, like the points were getting a worth double because mm. Leicester win, they open up a bigger gap. Leicester get a point, they go they go a games. A goal difference is going to count as a point, Chris. Yeah. So even if we weren't three points clear, that would be a goal. A goal difference overtaken could be pivotal to to the league positions as well. We've got a big one over Ipswich, which helps us out a lot. That's like an extra point on Ipswich, and Leeds. It's closer; they're ahead of us. But you know what I mean, Chris. Mm. And that's just Leicester's first task is to get to some form of advantage if they are allowed to in last, the next four games. Last question before uh, we we round it up. Um, anything mm. other than the top two finish is going to be um, a capitulation, isn't it, really? I think it's going to be more heartache and frustration than it's a capitulation or a disappointment because I honestly have been so impressed with what the good things off the field that Maresk and, well, I've been impressed with some of the things with most of what he's got on the pitch, right, for the majority of the season. But off the pitch, what he's done... The atmosphere he's created, the players he's managed to keep around, whether that was on a one season promise or not, we'll we'll we'll, we'll see. But mm. if you said to a Leicester fan, come April May time, you're going to be fighting for the top two. You're going to be at least in the top three, very well situated in the top three because we are now with Southampton's result, well in that top three spot. Yeah. Um, I think you would a bit you'd have, you'd have snapped someone's arm off for it, wouldn't you, Chris? realistically in august so more disappointment and, and, and frustration if we don't get the top two but i wouldn't sit here and say we have failed to do what we were meant to achieve because you've got to be respectful to everybody in this division anybody can be everybody we've seen it throughout the season even to leeds and ipswich and southampton who have lost to teams um that we've lost to um 
and if you kind of spread it out throughout the season, balances out, it probably looks a bit better and we don't feel as bad. I think you said that yesterday. If them losses, it'd have come more spread out. Um, mm. But yeah, I would still, on the best of form, Chris, I, I would still fancy Leicester to get promoted uh, in, in the top two spots. I would still see it's achievable because, yeah, all right, Leeds grabbed a late goal to make it look better than it was. Mm. But they've both shown that all three teams are showing that the nerves are there. And I think it's just a case of who's going to blink first. Because yes. if someone blinks now, it could be hard to to get that back. Yes. And I just want to say to uh, any Leeds fans that are watching, and I did this earlier, but I just want to reiterate it now that all the games have been played today. The best team in the championship at the moment are Ipswich because they are top. And despite yeah. what the Leeds fan that was saying, come in, well, we've won this, and they got that wrong anyway, didn't he? You corrected him. Um, but yep, yeah, they are. Uh, uh, and fair play to Ipswich, fair play. Going to be an interesting seven weeks. Only Leicester could do it this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah this is typical. 17 Leicester, points then. ahead, we'd, we'd, we'd be guaranteed promotion by now, wouldn't we? I think. <laughs> Pretty much, all, but yeah. a case of it more be, we'd all be waiting for the ink to dry, wouldn't we? On the Yes. On the return slip. Um, yeah, we will be back on Friday at um, seven with the prediction show with your new partner, Dave. Yes, um, we'll be. On tell that. everybody about your channel as well. Yeah, it's LTID TV2. It is the home of the WSL Leicester City women's team. Uh, watch alongs as and when available, as long as they don't clash with the men's game. And if they're available on, on the FA player, and I can do them. Uh, any breaking news? I hadn't. I was going to do a show on the whole Willie Kirk fiasco, but I don't think it's one into talking about. It's just, it's it was something I was going to do, but then time kind of got away from me and I really thought about it. It's not a topic I really want to talk about, really. I think if the alleges, which are obviously true because he's been sacked, I don't really want to discuss him and give him the time of day. This is, this is, I don't it's, think he's um, actually broken any law. No, it's but it's, it's just, it's not right, though, Chris. I know, but it, it just damages the women's game, unfortunately. Yeah, whether you like yeah, it, yeah, whether yeah, you right. think it should or not, it's just damaging to the game because it's just like, oh, male, why don't we have female managers in there? All they want to get the leg over. And it's just the sort of sexism you don't need in football. It shouldn't, like racism, it's not needed in football. It doesn't have a place. And I just thought it's going to cause more harm than good because some, some top. Yeah, no, didn't, you're, you're quite right. You, you know are what I mean? Quite. LTL doing TV do for the one LCFC women's the watch along and the LTL TV quiz the football the LCFC football and pyramid go and check it out if you haven't already the quiz is great Craig's already gonna picked it for me see if you can beat the Leicester City uh, football pyramid over on there and if you can message me on Twitter at full time focus or X whatever you want to call it uh, if you think you're good enough to climb the LCFC football pyramid because I'm going to do an episode with Dave. Hopefully next week. I need to discuss some dates and times with yourself and with him so we're not clashing on shows. But we will have that up and running. So, yeah, LTL TV, do go ahead over there and, and hit the like and subscribe button on that, please. We're getting one more today, Chris. So, thank you for your shout out and the watch along. Got I think that was actually today. a Bournemouth fan that you got today. Oh, did I get, did I get the vet? You, no, no, no. You got his, oh, his co host, Matthew. Got no, 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 no. Uh, you got you got his 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 friend Matthew Harrison, I believe he's called. Oh, thank you uh, to the uh, to the non veterinary uh, Bournemouth fan. And we will be back on Thursday on here um, with the preview show, and hopefully we're going to get a Birmingham City fan. I'm just waiting for uh, the tilt and end to get back to me. We'll be doing that Thursday at seven. But that's it. Bank holiday over. We're back to whatever we normally do tomorrow morning. Uh, thanks to everybody that has been uh, watching and joining in. Do appreciate it. Thanks to Brad, as always. And thanks to everybody that's been listening to us on podcast. Uh, thank you for lending us your ears. But for now, it's a good night from me. And it's good night from him. Good night, guys. Good night. Thanks for watching. These videos are tremendous. You better like them too or I'll be back. The TalkSport Fan Network is the ultimate on-demand destination for the UK's best fan-led football podcasts. Including Leicester Till I Die. Independent analysis and reaction for the Foxes faithful. The TalkSport Fan Network. Unbeatable club-dedicated content created by the fans for the fans. Follow the podcast on the TalkSport Fan Network.